A lot of people don't know that Reed, what year was it, 97, social net? Yes. In 1997, which was extremely early in social media, in fact, Six Degrees, which was the very first social anything, was 96, I think, and it was still just taking off in 97. In 97, Reed started something called Social Net, which was a social dating-oriented kind of thing without a lot of the features we think of today as social networking, but it had a lot of elements that we do include in social networking today. And uh, it, it had a modest success, right? I mean, it wasn't a d failure at all. It had millions of users, yes. right? Yes. Um, but why did that end anyway? What, what was the ending of that? Well, the, uh, and this is mic number three, if anyone. Oh, yeah, there, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, basically, part of the, the, uh, the incomplete conception on in the first iteration of this, and I wish I still owned the domain social net, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, was basically that it was much yeah it was much more transactional uh, and less persistent in terms of how it so it was all based on whether it was dating or professional networking or roommates or uh, carpools or activities like finding golf partners and everything else it was completely a profile for finding other people and meeting the new people but it had no kind of permanent transaction you know permanent state where you're interacting with the people around you so it was you didn't like have a set of you didn't have a social graph kind yes, of thing exactly yeah, yeah, no yeah, social yeah. graph and so yeah. And so part of, like, after, um, you know, watching Six Degrees and thinking about what, the, what was going on with the Internet and all the rest of it was, ah, this is what social networking will actually ultimately become. Right. Um, which is a combination of how you interact with people you know um, yeah. and how do you, you know, bring uh, both kind of, you know, personal joy to it and also professional success and also how do you meet other people that you don't know yet. And okay. that, was the, so that just, was the key thing. There. So just to continue on the introduction, so he had this thing, very attentive to Six Degrees. Six Degrees happens to have had a patent on some of the most central things that are still necessary for social networking, like, for example, initiating a friend relationship via email. Very basic. They own a patent. They owned a patent for that. Reed was very aware of that. That, pa that company went under in 2000, I believe. And was it late? Two th it was like 2000 or 2001? Anyway, yeah. it doesn't matter the date. Reed and Mark Pincus, <coughs> we all know who he is, uh, I hope, um, together went to the auction. Did you come to New York for that? Nope. Or you we we were phone? doing it remotely. Yeah. Did it remotely. There was an auction of the, of the, uh, of the patent at the, as the company was being you know, dissolved. And Reed and, and Mark bought that patent, which remains the central patent in social media. And in fact, if they were to ever choose to attempt to uh, enforce their patent rights, you know, it would be very complicated because people would then sue the shit out of them and all kinds <laughs> of stuff. But that's how patents work. You know, it's mutually assured destruction. But he has a very powerful tool. Now, I don't know, we, don't, we won't get into this, but in the reporting for my book, what they told me was the reason they got that patent was Reed had already started LinkedIn at that point, and Mark had Tribe.net, which were two of the very early social networks, and they didn't want anybody to mess around with what they were doing, and so they basically just wanted to sort of take this patent and lock it up so that no one would use it against them. And uh, I believe Jonathan Abrams at Friendster was very eager to have that patent, among others, but he didn't get it, even though Reed was an investor in Friendster. Uh, he was the first investor in Friendster. I mean, the things that he did is amazing in terms of this whole industry. The very first angel in Friendster, right? Yep. Um, in on the very first round of Facebook with Peter Thiel uh, and Mark Pincus. But frankly, one of the reasons they were in that, although I don't think you knew that exactly until I was doing the interview and all the interviews I've done, I think Sean Parker wanted you in that because he didn't want the people who owned that patent to ever have any risk of suing Facebook. And Sean Parker's a very canny fellow on such matters. In any case, however it happened, Reed has, you know, Series A shares of Facebook, which are rather valuable these days, since uh, the, the, that was a, you know, Peter's investment was $500,000 at a $10 million valuation for, for uh, 5% of the company, wait, was that right? No, $500, $5 million, it was 10% of the company that Reed bought. So, I mean, that, that Peter bought, sorry, sorry, sorry. So Reed probably got something like one, a little less than, Peter, if you and Mark together, maybe a little less than 1% of the company, something like that, at the time. Yeah, we each put in uh, a little less than 50K. Yeah, well, that was, so that was a little less than 1% each, right. So just think, uh, if it was you, anyway, since, uh, <laughs> So the point is, he had already started LinkedIn. Everybody here knows what that is. I guess we don't need to go down the path of, you know, what is LinkedIn or anything. But now, you, let's just take, bring it up to the present, since that was our long-winded introduction. What are you doing now? Because you have basically left full-time work at LinkedIn now, right? No, actually, my, 
Uh, I thought uh, you weren't working there full time. No, no, I'm still executive chairman. So the actual my principal, principal office is still next door to You're Jeff. Still, I knew you were chairman. Okay, yeah. fine. Okay. So um, uh, part of the, uh, the what I'm exploring this year is uh, how do you do two full time jobs at the same time, um, which is always entertaining. So at LinkedIn, I'm focused on things that involve the board, strategic alliances, key product initiatives, uh, working with Jeff Wiener as the CEO, you know, those sorts of things. Great CEO, by the way. Yep, totally agree. Um, and it's part of what allowed me to also, because uh, I have his uh, thoughts about how uh, the angel system and the venture system are going to be evolving. And uh, because one of the, thing, one of the uh, venture firms that's doing a very good job, I think, of adapting to what the next decade is, Greylock, and when they kind of came to me and said, look, we Major have this, holder in Facebook yep, also. Yep. Um, uh, we have this model by which uh, partners here can work full time at one of our companies, because Anil Busri does that with Workday. Uh, would you be interested in doing that here and building out some of your ideas in venture while you're also doing LinkedIn? It was like, oh, yes, this. this Raylock's like, an investor in LinkedIn. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it all fits together. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> exactly. So I'm both doing uh, the LinkedIn stuff, which is, you know, realistically probably about four and a half days a week, um, and then uh, Greylock, which is kind of between half a day and a day. Okay, so let's then talk about LinkedIn. This current state of, of, of play there, uh, how, how should we be thinking about LinkedIn's future opportunity going forward from here? And how many, mem how many active users does it have now? Uh, so we have over 55 million uh, globally. Um, uh, that's registered users? That's registered users. Uh, and how many of those typically come in in a month? In a month, currently I think it's about 24, 25. Uh, I haven't seen what uh, January is tracking towards, uh, but that was kind of the end of last year. And I mean, wh what I think is interesting is is that I, I still think that the majority of professionals haven't realized what they need to be doing in terms of uh, how do they manage, for example, the brand of themselves, how do they manage themselves as small businesses, and what are the set of tools that you need to do in order to do that with your career. So I think, for example, a lot of people still think LinkedIn, oh, it's really useful for hiring or for jobs, and it is very useful for those things. But they haven't, for example, uh, uh, thought about questions like, well, how do I find other professionals like me so that I can find out what the <coughs> current tools are, what the current innovations are, in order to stay competitive as a professional. And that's the thing that we're still essentially building towards and creating a environment where kind of each professional gets the personal business intelligence that's uh, useful to them. Um, and of course, unlike most social networks, all social networks that are devoted towards consumers, you have the ability to charge serious money for access to the data that's in there and for sort of a premier user can pay hundreds of dollars a month to you and a lot of them do. So you have, what's the revenue range that you got for LinkedIn these days on an annualized basis? Um, so uh, we actually don't, one of the benefits of being a private company is we don't uh, talk uh, specific numbers. One of the benefits of being a journalist <laughs> is one can try to get it anyway. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with that dynamic. <laughs> um, the, uh, but we have three revenue streams. It's uh, uh, subscriptions at the website where you get enhanced search and communications and kind of uh, CRM capabilities. We have a SaaS product that we sell to corporations, uh, which is actually even a more robust version of that. And then we have advertising. And each of these uh, revenue streams is actually roughly equal. Mm. And they're roughly growing at, um, you know, depends a little bit on what happens in terms of economic crisis, uh, but it's between 70 and 100% per year. How many people, individuals, are paying some amount for access to various levels of LinkedIn's data? Um, it's, it, you know, it's all of these models where you have a, fr a freemium model, where you have a free and subscription is, is actually, relatively speaking, low percentages. So no, I know we, it's low yeah. percentages, but it doesn't have to be too many since some are yes. paying hundreds of dollars, yes, right? Yes, exactly. So um, uh, I don't think uh, we have yet revealed subscriber numbers. Uh, it's actually a, a very low percentage of the base, but uh, in fact, because you know, prices, uh, like for example, you can, the top price subscription is $500 a month, you know, it ends up with a lot of money. Yeah, it does seem like you can't really be a hiring manager at a company without being a fairly active user of LinkedIn these days, because yep. it's very effective at that. And also, just to go back to how you got to LinkedIn after doing this dating kind of thing, you concluded what that led you to, 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 to an enterprise-oriented, business-oriented thing? Well, so uh, in 2002, I basically thought that there were going to be a massive revolution, which is now called Web 2.0, in the consumer internet based upon everyone having a presence and an identity. And I thought there would be two major themes. I thought there would be a social theme and a professional theme, and that they would actually be separate. One of the th mistakes I think I made at social I was I thought that, you know, 
everything looks like a duck and everything is a duck. And actually, I think that there's different modes of interaction. It's how you present yourself, what your profile looks like, uh, what kinds of people you're trying to connect with or associate with is different in the different contexts. And so I basically decided to invest in all the social and entertainment things. And that continued all the way through investing in Zynga and some of the investments that I made as angels prior to joining Greylock. Too bad you did that. Yes. Zynga, damn, what a, what a way. Yes, anyway. exactly. Well, it was part of when I uh, looked at the Facebook platform and I saw what people were using Facebook for. And remember, we talked about this. Um, the sorry private conversation earlier was that it was it's a heavily social environment and Zynga is all about social games, and then I decided that what I wanted to put my own time towards was how do professionals change the nature of kind of their taking control of their economic destiny because one of the trends that's happening is the term career I don't even think really appropriately refers anymore because what people have implicitly in their mind when they're leaving college is kind of like oh. It used to be I joined one company like IBM and I worked my way up and a career is kind of going through the notches at a division or a function. And then you say, well, I now change companies. So it's still a career ladder, but first it was IBM, then it's HP, then it's Cisco or whatever. I actually think what's happening with a modern worker is that that, that kind of model for what happens with a career is no longer the right model. The model is actually much more like a small business. And you actually end up changing industry, you end up changing functions, even industries are changing within the time period of a decade. And so, yeah, you know, sure. for example, take journalism. Or less, yeah. <laughs> right. Like in one year, magazine <laughs> industry like goes away. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so, so yeah. what I think has, has to happen now is every uh, individual has to look at their, uh, their themselves as equivalent of a small business and as equivalent of an entrepreneur. And the same kind of thinking that you apply to how you guide a small business in terms of market forces is how you actually uh, guide a career. And, mm -hmm. and that's the set of, of tools that I think is happening. And so I said, all right, I'm really interested in this transition. So what's the way that uh, the Web 2.0 is going to uh, influence this? And what are the key elements of the platform, which is like an online professional identity, a network of people you collaborate with, and these sorts of things as a platform for the necessary applications by which an individual now you know, navigates their career. Okay, are you confident, and this is very pertinent to the panel we're about to have too, where a number of other companies are in very similar businesses to yours. Are you confident that professional social networking will remain separate and distinct from other in the form of particularly Facebook? Uh, yes, very Why? much. Basically because it's a question of where the natural gravity is, right? So, um, and what kind of uh, interactions you expect to have. So. Uh, in, um, uh, in, in Facebook, uh, the natural gravity is, because you're sharing pictures of vacations and all the kinds of other things, is to connect with a variety of people that matter to you, um, and that you're sharing this kind of, what's going on with my life, right? Uh, there's a reason why, like for example, one of the things that people have talked, it's funny, I've been pitched on, well, you know, what's the Facebook for the corporation? Well, the same reason there isn't enterprise photo sharing, where, you know, people selling enterprise photo sharing into corporations so that people can share photos inside the corporation. Yeah, boy, that sounds like a thrill. Huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's the reason that kind of activity, right, is, 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 um, uh, doesn't translate into the work environment. It's kind of like the difference between the, the, the home and the office. And so when you're uh, presenting yourself in a professional environment, there's a number of people that you actually collaborate and work with, even have a beer with, that aren't the same people that you discuss how you're raising your children with. <laughs> right? And so uh, in the context of how you present yourself, what kinds of, of tasks you're trying to accomplish. So for example, in a, on a professional task, it's things like, uh, like, all right, should we build our own billing uh, order and billing management system, or should we license one? What do we find is currently there? That kind of thing, oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, that kind of thing that you find um, is actually, you're not necessarily, you might be looking for someone you already know, um, but you're actually looking for uh, the right expertise to help you solve a problem very quickly. Now, one of the things that I actually personally discovered LinkedIn being useful for that I didn't anticipate when I was launching it is when you have a lot of information about the people you're connected to, when I now ask questions of things like, huh, like what's the new pattern for, um, how, like, for example, what's currently going on in terms of SEO, right? Like, so it's a, it's a way internet businesses grow. What's the current patterns by which some businesses succeed at this and some fail? Well, I can actually go to LinkedIn, sort by my connections, and type in SEO, and all of a sudden I go, oh, that's right, so and so is really good at this too. I should go ask them as well. That kind of you just deep, search for it. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. That kind of deep knowledge base okay. about what's going on with ac my actual connections is also helpful. All right. Well, we could that, we could go down yeah. the path longer than we have time for, but we we actually don't have much more time. But I would love you to talk really quickly about how you just analyze and and describe the current sort of Web 2.0 landscape. What 
where are we now? Where are the opportunities? Yep. What are the, where are the disjuncts? So uh, one of the things that's common in Silicon Valley is it's kind of mad after the future. So people have been talking about Web 3.0 for a couple of years now. I don't think we're there yet. I actually think Yeah, nobody knows what that yeah, means. It yeah. just sounds good to say yeah, it's happening. Sounds like the right? next yeah. thing. And so I, I think that the fundamental title shifts that happen with Web 2.0 are in fact still we're in the middle of, which is everyone's learning to have an electronic presence online um, and apps are being built off that, that that extend and transform how we connect with each other and what kinds of ways we can communicate and collaborate for uh, deep personal value, both on the social and professional. Now, the new trends, I think, one of the things that I think a combination of the iPhone and Android have kicked free is I think that the Web 2.0 stuff is now also beginning to hit mobile. It isn't, everyone says, oh, it's there now. It's there now for the relatively techie crowd and so forth. But I actually think the same thing that gets to being more universal, you know, so for example, you know, the classic way this is discussed is when my mom is using, you know, an iPhone, which she isn't yet, right, in order to have a presence online by which she is navigating through her social world, her professional world, then that's when the Web 2.0 trends has really started hitting the mass market. I think that that we're gonna see the more of the elaboration of having an identity and presence, but now, for example, where you are geophysically located, an immediacy that comes from the fact that the phone's always with you, whereas the computer isn't, um, those sorts of things will actually, I think, generate even some more new apps. Okay. I hate to say it, but we have to wrap it there because we've only got 29 minutes and I have a panel we gotta be yeah. now, now continue to. I hope you won't leave the room so that if we can ambush you with a relevant question <laughs> in the next few minutes, we'll still be able to. If I'll possible. try, but I think the shuttle's leaving. Whatever you gotta do, you yes. gotta do. Yep. So thank you, Reed. Good to Thanks see you. Thanks so much. Yes. <laughs> so if the panel would come up on stage, please. Thank you all. Hi. How good to see you. Hi. So, uh, why do you know what I think would be good to start? Why don't you each just th these 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 are social new social net also social network leaders, uh, more of the new generation. Why do you each just briefly identify yourselves and say what it is you do? That would just be a quick start and efficient rather than me trying to garble it somehow. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Mark Sonadella. Is this on? Yep, very long. Uh, CEO and founder of uh, The Ladders. We're the largest professional uh, jobs website in the world. Uh, in the U.S., we're only jobs that are 100K plus. In uh, the U.K., only 50,000 pounds plus. And we really just focus on that top level. Uh, it ends up being about the top 10% of jobs. And how, how do you measure your size? What would be numbers that you could give us? Uh, so we've got three and a half million people registered on our weekly newsletter. That's yeah. all about uh, uh, job information. And uh, as for revenues, we're, all, uh, we're on the cusp of doing 100 million this year. Is there a sort of a social graph in there of connections that, as Breed put it, were persistent? Or is it not really a social network per se? Uh, it's uh, it's interesting. So social networks are fantastic at connecting you to professional colleagues or your your friends, your your family. Uh, when you get into more specialized areas and jobs is a more uh, specialized area, the control that people want to have over their presence uh, really goes dramatically up. So it's not a uh, open network. We're really more of a closed, curated network. Okay. Cool. Uh, Nazar, uh, CEO of Forticom. Uh, we're the parent company of a number of leading local social networks, uh, such as Odnoklastiki, the leading uh, Russian social network, Nasha Klasa, the leading Polish social network, and one, the leading uh, social network in the Baltics. Um, overall, we're, uh, you know, you add us all up on a combined basis. We got 17, 17 or 18 million daily unique users, which actually globally makes us the third largest social networking company. Um, Behind Facebook and who else? And I think Orkut's just a little bit ahead of what us. What about MySpace? We're actually bigger than MySpace. Really? Yeah. By what? By by the measure? Daily, daily uh, unique visitors. Oh, which, really? to us, we think we think that's the most relevant measure because um, that's reflective of how engaged your users are. So w one good measure for you know how well your social network's doing is is user engagement, which you can define as daily users divided by monthly users. So do you, you operate these, all these networks yourself in various countries? It's, it's really kind of, a, yeah. kind of a parent company for a variety of national social networks, right? That's right. I mean, yeah. w not to sound like the American guy talking about America, but uh, it's, we, we kind of operate as a, a federation. Mm -hmm. So Forticom is like a federal government, and then we have state governments, uh, local teams, great local teams in each of our countries uh, who know the markets, know what users are after, uh, you know, know how to drive user engagement and monetization. And Yuri Milner, who some of you may have heard before, his involvement is? 
So GST is our majority shareholder. Majority shareholder, just in case you wanted. Okay, thank you. Stefan. Stefan Gosebeck, I'm the CEO of Xing. Uh, Xing is Europe's leading business network with about eight, eight and a half million members worldwide, three and a half million in the German speaking region, which makes us strong number one in the German speaking markets. About one in five professionals in the major cities is a member of our platform and with very high activity rates, which makes us unique. So I'm curious, since you know you are kind of the European LinkedIn in, in many people's mind, um, anything Reed said that you found you disagreed with, or would you basically echo most of his points about the difference between sort of the personal and the professional? No, I, I fundamentally agree with most of what Reed said. Um, you know, especially the discussion which we're having a lot about sort of you know is there a difference between sort of your social, private life, and your business life. And I fundamentally believe the answer is, is yes. Um, you know, in Germany we have this, we have this saying, Dienst is Dienst und Schnaps is Schnaps. You, you know what Schnaps is? It's, yeah. this, it's this drink. Yes, and and so what it means is you, you work. <laughs> that's right. And so what it means is you, your work is your work, and then your Schnaps is your Schnaps. And, and you better not mix the two, right? And it's, it's a very old saying. But it speaks to the fact that there's, you know, people move in different contexts, right? Yeah. So we play different roles in our life with a private life where we are a friend or a father, and that we have a business life where we are a, a colleague and a boss or a manager. And I think people see those different contexts reflected in their web life as well. And, and so I think that's sort of a very natural human behavior, which I'm getting a lot of feedback on that that continues to be the case. So I'm, I very much agree with sort of what Reed said earlier. Okay, you know, but one of the interesting things, uh, I mean, I just did this Milner uh, Breyer thing. One of the things your, Breyer said was that, you know, they don't really want to invest in a company at Excel now that doesn't have a global strategy. Now, Zing is very European, right? What, do you have a global strategy? We have an international strategy, uh, but we're in a sort of not in the, in the global race because what we define ourselves as we're sort of the most valuable network. So what we are, we're more sort of interwoven with our local community than our competitors, which makes us strong and, for example, gives us a very unique business model. Yeah. Uh, I think Reed was talking about sort of the number of people paying on, on his platform. For us, it's one in five. So in our core one market, in five one in one in five users pay something? pay a monthly fee in order to use the site. And that's obviously it very important. It sounds like it's a lot higher our, than LinkedIn, our, too. Yeah. Uh, well, they don't publish numbers, but it's got to be higher. Um, for us, it's public. We're a public company, so it's, it's, very, it's, it's very transparent. And that, that what makes us unique. And it's not just because, or it's not because people are more willing to pay in general. Uh, I think it's because the um, you know, level of depth we have. So let me give you an example. We have a network of about a couple hundred uh, what we call ambassadors. Uh, Xing ambassadors, these are people which sort of cover all major cities and also mid-sized cities in the country. And they're our local representatives. We don't pay them. Uh, they're, they're community members um, who sort of do local events, Xing branded events to network and to give us a, a level of interwovenness, if that word exists in English, yeah, uh, uh, which, which really a local network can drive much, much farther and much, much deeper than a global but rather shallow player can. Okay. Nizar, do you have something you want? Yeah, and I just want to agree and uh, build on that. The, uh, uh, I know the interest in the global network, and hey, it's wonderful when you have a half billion or a billion uh, users, but one of the early promises of the Internet was, hey, by making location not determinative of who you can connect with, uh, it's going to enable interest groups to connect or people with the same interests or same level or same uh, situation in life to uh, connect. And the, uh, the ability for, well, in the, in the broadest sense, you know, uh, Facebook connects everybody, then there are the professional networks, then we're just focused on jobs. Uh, I think it's really interesting how you pointed out that the local networks have a, a greater value to the users and a higher value to the users than the broad gl uh, global uh, reach. And if you look at revenue per user. Facebook has 400 million users worldwide, did, what, 600 million last year? It's $1.50 per user. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, 55 million users worldwide. Re revenue estimates are 100 to 150, so call it 250 a user. Zing, with a, uh, a deeper penetration into uh, the German-speaking uh, marketplace with 8 million users, 64 million U.S. Uh, revenue, $8 per user. We're 3 million uh, users, we're you know, north of 75 million, $25 a user. So I think when you look at networks... You, Interesting you, taxonomy. I yeah, like that, yeah. You, you, need, you need to look at not just, hey, how broad is it, because you can be a mile wide and an inch deep, but then the, to me, and I guess obviously speaking from somebody in a uh, very particular segment of the business, the really exciting thing is how uh, the internet enables uh, networks to be created that are very small, uh, very focused, 
on a particular problem and can be so very deeply valuable to people as measured by the revenue per user. And I think that's why Zing, with their slightly, I mean, it's a, it's a different model as opposed to LinkedIn that has, on average, the average user at LinkedIn doesn't visit the site in a month. Yeah. Right, and okay. uh, the average user at Zing visits, I, I know it's higher. Much, much higher than that. So yeah. and, and Why is that, by the way? Well, Quickly. I think it goes to very much with, with what's been said before. So, so um, the level of activity is much higher in our home market than what from... I'm sorry, what was... The level of activity... Level of activity. Uh, yeah. ...is higher for us in our market than, for example, for LinkedIn in their market. And it's, I mean, fundamentally, it's because people get more value out of it. And so, for example, people use the site not just to manage their existing network of relationships, you know, having it all the time updated and having, you know, latest phone number changes and all that. But they actually build relationships, new relationships on the site. And, yeah. and, and it, there is more of a social component to it than there is to LinkedIn, well, which is kind of so, resolutely not a social thing, right? Yeah. It, well, remember, it's a business context, so yeah. it's, it's for but a special still with purpose, a little bit of a social that, overlay. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and it yeah. combines in a very special way sort of your online activities with offline activities. So there's yeah. hundreds, hundreds of thousands of physical events meetings, conferences, uh, networking events, organized by the community and promoted through Xing. So you, you can okay. specifically approach the probably, I don't know how many events being organized around DLD, where people contact each other through Xing because they find each other interesting and then they meet for yeah. a business purpose. Yeah. So these are, you know, you're, I'd love to hear your perspective on this question of social versus professional or, you know, the, the life and the schnapps or whatever it was, work and the schnapps. Um, <laughs> Because you are running general interest social networks, and, they're, and t I, if I understand correctly, yours are pretty technologically and you know, interface-wise sophisticated, and they're not Facebook clones, which is something I admire since, for example, Contacta, which is Yuri's, basically he owns more or less in Russia, is one, like uh, Studivat said, total copy of Facebook, and succeeded because it got there first before Facebook attempted. But it looks like, I mean, Contact's logo looks like Facebook's logo, for example. I mean, there's all kinds of that. But anyway, so you do something different. Is it true that the professional is absolutely separate? Uh, I, I do think it's separate, but before I get into that, I actually I want to touch on what these two guys were saying before. Good, fine. Um, which is, you know, both in terms of engagement and in terms of monetization, I completely agree with you uh, that, you know, if you, if you focus locally, you can derive uh, much higher values in both those areas. So, you know, for us, uh, we're a private company, we, we don't have to give our financials, but, you know, we made triple digit million dollars in revenues last year. Uh, you know, we have, call it uh, 35 to 40 million active users. So, you know, and the on, primary on, revenue sources were what? Uh, there's, there's two sources. So there's advertising and then there's user payments, which we, we've actually been, you know, pretty pioneering in. So, you know, on, on a per user basis, you're at monetization levels that are significantly higher than what you see at Facebook or, or, or comparable. Uh, comparable social networks, and we're very profitable, we're very cash flow positive, and growing, you know, like doubling year over year, so uh, I, I agree, you can derive a lot more value from the users, but you can also derive a lot more engagement from the users. So, you know, if you look at us in terms of dailies versus actives, if you look at us in terms of, you know, time spent per unique visitor or time spent per unique visit, we're consistently at the top of the charts uh, worldwide. Uh, because we have teams that focus on delivering local value to our local users. Yeah, so yeah. I, I completely agree with, with you guys on that point. Um, but then the, why, why, is, why is the revenue, I'm sorry to bump into the question, why sure. is the revenue uh, level higher than Facebook? If you both have high level of engagement, what do you do different that? Yeah, I mean. They, um, they seek revenue. Well, yeah, I, I think it's two things. You know, number Somebody one. Somebody should have laughed at that, but okay, go ahead. Number one, uh, <laughs> I would say that, you know, the majority of everybody's life, for 90% of the people, 90% of your life is based on where you live, right? And if you have local partnerships, if you understand the local market, and you get the fact that fundamentally, people in different markets, people in different countries, live their lives in different ways, and they use the internet in different ways. If you can understand that, um, and we have local teams who do understand that, then you can derive a lot more value from your users. Uh, you know, both in terms of doing innovative things on the advertising front, uh, so, you know, having special projects or very high engagement projects. I mean, in Russia, last year, uh, we had one, one advertising project, which was kind of like a game slash quiz, which, um, you know, basically half of our users, half of our monthly users actively engaged with the project. And one of your companies is the second largest social network in Russia, right? Is that correct? Uh, oh, no, Klastiki. It's actually, depending on, on how Third? you count, we're, we're, probably, we're probably number one in the CIS region in general. Um, so, so you know, we're, we're so doing pretty really well. So you're really up there. Yeah. We're, we're doing pretty well. But, um, 
Okay. I mean, what I the thing the thing that I think has you, to be you're asking about like sort of yeah. We'll go back to that quickly, like, and then you, I want to go touch on that. Yeah. I mean, the, the way I personally see it is, you know, you live your life in one of two locations mainly: your home and your office, right? And so, uh, you know, from a home perspective, uh, you know, I think that's where general interest social networks kind of are more natural. Like fits. yours. Like ours. Uh, but, you know, personally, we believe that social networking, you know, it's such a buzzword. Uh, ultimately, we believe that social networks are just an online manifestation of your real life. That's it, right? So everything that you do in your real life, we try to replicate online and just make it easier for you. You know, so uh, whether you're communicating, engaging in content, engaging in commerce, all of that, the hub of all that should be the social network. I mean, an interesting thing to note is that actually the professionally oriented social networks all have always been fundamentally identity-based with your real name. They had to be because that was the nature of the business. And they, when they were created earlier in the social media evolution, almost all social social networks were still essentially anonymous or quasi-anonymous in, in a Friendster, MySpace, etc. Facebook being the one exception, which I always argue is the single biggest reason why they killed, there's a lot of other reasons, but killed MySpace, killed you know, Orkut, whatever. Uh, but, but so you guys, Zing, LinkedIn, had that because you had to. And I think, but, but, but let's just like go to the cut to the chase here because the reality is all of you uh, are now living in a world that is dominated by a, a, a player that has astonishing ambitions as we heard, you know, Jim and Yuri talking about before and, and which I certainly am familiar with. Uh, and they talk, they use the word ubiquity at Facebook shamelessly all the time, you know ubiquity, right? And the reason they don't have more revenue per user is not because they couldn't. It's because they don't even really want to. They want to have enough revenue to keep growing and no more because they don't want to seek revenue at the risk of causing fewer people to join. They would much rather have more members than they would have more, member, mem uh, more revenue, but you know, they got to have enough revenue to pay for the new members, but they're managing that okay. So here they are growing 25 million a month or something like that on a global basis. And they are a major presence in every country in which you guys operate, and a growing presence in every country. So, not. which ones are they not? Uh, not Russia, but what aside from Russia? They're not. They're not really in Russia. Uh, they're you know uh, way way behind in the Baltics um, and way way behind in Poland as well. How far so, behind are they in Poland? I mean, you know, they're probably one tenth our size. They haven't focused much on Poland. They're starting to focus a little on Russia, uh, and the Baltics. You know. They're not the giantest uh, country. I would say, I would say your, your point about revenue seeking, that would be I mean, valid. Don't think they're not going to get there, by the yeah. way. I, I would just, you're not relying on that, I hope. No, of course not. Uh, look, Facebook's a great competitor. And, you know, every day, uh, they're, our, our industry ultimately, it's not about who's first, it's who's best, right? And every day, we're trying to be the best, and every day, they're trying to be the best. And it's a great fight, you know, and they're a great competitor. Um, but your point about revenue seeking, I think that's valid if the user engagement levels were dropping as a result. You know, I think the point that I made about no, no, that's local true. relevancy and having higher user engagement as a result, yeah, that's kind that's of... That's ideal. That's a perfect us, scenario. To yeah, us, yeah. That's, it's not revenue seeking that drives our revenues. It's actually providing just higher value. Um, so... No, I'm it, not it saying they're going to steal your business, but they become a, a greater and greater factor in the landscape that, you know... Well, go ahead. So, so, if I, uh, so as a customer of... Uh, uh, the social networks, and we're uh, one of the largest advertisers on LinkedIn. Um, you know, it goes from the general, there's the whole internet, there's Yahoo, there's Facebook, to the more specialized, to uh, LinkedIn and uh, uh, to Zing, to the more specialized, we're just for, you know, uh, professional jobs. And uh, so I can tell you as an as a advertiser on a whole bunch of different sites that, um, so when we're advertising on LinkedIn, the ads are more effective because people are thinking about their profession, their career, managing their career. We might even uh, be in front of the same users on financial sites like CNN Money or, or, breaking, or uh, Market Watch or whatnot. Might be in front of the exact same users, but then they're thinking about finance as opposed to, uh, as opposed to their careers. So the concept that, hey, uh, once somebody is logged into a website, now their entire life is open to them, uh, misses, the, uh, misses an understanding of how people utilize media. So similar on, with magazine business, how it started off that Life and Saturday Evening Post covered everything, and then we had the fracturing of uh, the magazine audience into Sports Illustrated and People and then Teen People and everything. Uh, we're, I think we see the same thing on, website, on the web where 
Uh, yes, there are general interest sites, and people will have a general interest there. And uh, uh, you know, you can Facebook's big success in advertising is social game, credit score, and dating uh, uh, so far. But those are very general interest uh, categories. As you get down into media properties and websites that have a more targeted audience and the mindset that the customer is in there, at least from what we see as a customer, the mindset that the customer uh, is in there leads to different possibilities uh, for advertising, for engagement, and for the tools that you can put in front of them. Um, so first of all, your, your statement I think is correct. And then Germany is a good example where it took Facebook a while to get traction, but, but they clearly have traction now. They're growing very fast. So that's, that's, uh, that's certainly a given. Um, at the same time, I think it doesn't remove the fundamental dichotomy we were talking about before. Um, you know, there's, and someone, one of you guys was saying this earlier, social networks really are a reflection of your everyday real life. They sort of reflect what you do anyways in a somewhat different way. And yes, indeed. You know, 90% of your life happens either in your home or in your office, and that doesn't change. Yeah. So fundamentally, the equation doesn't change yeah. um, just because Facebook now happens to be at a certain size, while maybe some other local competitor has been there before, maybe isn't. So it doesn't change the fundamental needs and 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 needs people have. I'm I'm being approached by so many people telling me, look, there's my colleague, or even worse, my boss wants to be my friend on Facebook. And I'm going like, I don't want to be my friend on Facebook. I might want to have a relationship with him in a, in a professional context. Um, but that's very different from being a friend uh, on yeah. Facebook. And let me add one subtlety to that. It's important to say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying the actual activities in a business network are completely different from the actual activities on a social network, <coughs> but the context is different. So what I mean by that is there's probably no office in the world where people don't also say flirt. Right, it happens everywhere. Well, and so it also obviously happens in a business network, but it makes a big difference whether the context is an office or a business network as yeah. opposed to somewhere else. So it's really about the context as opposed to the actual activity. Yeah, I, I think that all is fair, and I want to hear questions in, from the audience, so get ready, but I want to make, a, a, I think there's a caveat that needs to be made given you know, my em embeddedness in the Facebook mindset. I have to say this. You know, yesterday we had Mike Schrepfer on this stage talking about Facebook's vision, and it is not to be a website. So your point about basically, yes, your mind is in a different place when you're on a different kind of website makes perfect sense. Except if Facebook does ever achieve their goal, which they may not, but let's just not pretend they don't have this goal, to be mere infrastructure that brings a social component to other activities on the web, that that then changes the landscape. For one thing, what it does is it means other services can come into existence like your own much more rapidly with a social context, which they build on top of Facebook. So that presents you with the question, do you then somehow have a Facebook Connect integration in order to, in your country or your industry, whatever, try to preclude another player from competing with you using the platform that they present. And I don't think that's a near-term, no, this year threat, but I would predict that if, if, unless they really screw up, within two or three years, this is something you're going to actively be facing. Yes, um, and I agree. It, it sort of changes some of the economics, if you will, because sort of you could argue that something like Facebook Connect, once it spreads really wide, it sort of turns user um, acquisition into a commodity, right? So, it, which is very interesting. It does change um, sort of, mm. well, the economics and some of the rules of the game, but it's a great opportunity, right? So first yeah. of all, it's a great opportunity because it helps us as well. So yeah. obviously, the, 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 there are some strategic questions around here how to deal with that, uh, but there will be ways to make it work for us. So I don't really I don't see disagree it as a threat. At all, by the way. I totally I think, think the all three of you could find a way, you know, each one of you has a very, in a way, defensible, specific kind of business. So right. you're and, free. And, and so, I can think of a lot of other social networks right. I wouldn't say that for, by the way. Right. But and, and, and so, but so, so any, and I would call this an improvement in infrastructure almost. And so, you know, any improvement in infrastructure can benefit to those guys out there who have yeah, a exactly. value adding business. So th I think about it that way. And we all think about this very actively and, and um, think about how to deal with it. We're having conversations and, and we'll turn this into, op into an opportunity, I'm sure. Any comment on that, Nishan? Uh, yeah. Uh, Just quickly, because I want to get to your but I want to hear uh, your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, I do not think there's going to be one ring to rule them all. Uh, one what did you One ring to rule them all. One ring, yeah. You know, uh, I, I, think, I think about it like operating systems. If Facebook wants to be an operating system, then great. You know, there'll be an operating system in a number of different places, and there'll yeah. be a big operating system, and that's great. 
But let's not forget that in the sort of you know, PC operating system environment, there's also another company besides Microsoft that's an operating system that derives a lot of value and that addresses specific markets and does a great job of that and sure. dominates in those markets. Totally true. And so for us, uh, you know, we see ourselves as being the operating system within our markets. That's cool. Okay. I mean, there's already a, a system that globally connects users with things they're interested in, and that's Google. Um, and before that, there was Microsoft Passport. Uh, so I think to, this, to the extent that the infrastructure changes, it definitely enables different behaviors by people in the ecosystem uh, uh, like us. Um, so I, uh, I, as far as it goes as infrastructure, I think it's welcome. Uh, I have a tougher time seeing the threat to every media property or every subscription business out there from No, I don't Facebook say it as a connection. threat. I say it's, it's a landscape shift that requires, I mean, Stefan, I think, is talking about it the way I'm thinking of it. It just requires a strategic shift that's significant in some cases. But let's hear from the audience. Who has, I thought somebody was, okay, go over to the mic quick, quick, quickly, please. We've got a few more minutes. Identify yourself also. Um, Michael Morris uh, uh, from Germany. Um, two questions, actually, since nobody's asking questions. Uh, one to Mrs. Sinadella. So you're a segment leader in the U.S., uh, so what's next? IPO, or are you going to China or Europe? Are you coming here? And uh, second question, um, maybe to you and Mr. Groselbeck. Now, Xing is making more and more money with uh, sort of as a uh, personnel or sort of uh, with a job search uh, uh, market square, uh, really. And... Um, so are you really competitors or like LinkedIn? Uh, do you see sort of business models shifting closer to the ladders or do you see uh, these really being distinct? That's a good question. Uh, great question. So we're uh, number one in the US, number one in the UK, uh, launching in Canada in the early part of this year and then uh, uh, we'll be launching in Germany at the end of this year. Um, so that's, and then we'll be rolling out uh, country after country after that. We have a re relatively, uh, because we're so focused and just specialized on jobs, we have a relatively uh, heavy investment to go into any country. Uh, it's not like Facebook, which uh, launched in uh, Turkey with nobody there and actually became no number one in Turkey in a space of about eight weeks. Uh, when you're particularly focused on jobs and in the job market, it's, uh, it's a bit heavier investment. So we'll be uh, coming into uh, Germany uh, later this year. And then uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, Zing or LinkedIn, uh, again, we see uh, them as, uh, uh, partners further up the stream. Uh, they deal with everything careers. And then on the specialized issue of, hey, I really need help finding a job right now, uh, we can, we're the specialist that uh, really does a, a very technical specialist job on that. Uh, but we view LinkedIn and Zing as, as partners. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, so business networks change the way we think about careers and change the way we think about, you know, getting a job and coming to a next step in our career. So that's a fundamental change in all sort of the entire e-recruiting industries affected by this. And different players out there try different things to benefit from that development. And Ladders is one of them, which is very interesting. And the way we think about this is we have, we provide a, a, a business network, we're calling it the business graph. And uh, jobs are sort of one natural sort of vertical sitting on this business graph. There are others. Uh, but this is one, and we are talking to partners uh, um, actively right now. We're having some activities ourselves, and, and I'm sure we'll catch up after this meeting uh, to see if there's opportunity there. So it's clearly, you know, it is a great opportunity for business networks, uh, and we will be looking at partners to see how to benefit from it. You're all talked out. Another question, comment? Doesn't have to be a question. It could be an insult, for that matter. I like those. Uh, I mean. We could, we, I mean, anybody want to ask each other a question? I'm sort of out of questions. I mean, I think it's interesting. The three of you are obviously extremely smart CEOs with a very clear sense of the purpose of your business, which is obviously always ex extremely beneficial no matter what business you're in, and it's not always the case, uh, particularly in social media, I don't think. Uh, particularly, and, and, and if you look at, like, Bebo, these companies are just, like, really, they don't know, they're, like, f floundering. Uh, but you guys are not in a comparable position at all. Uh, so how about a question for you? So you've, you've just written Facebook Effect? Uh -huh. uh, so a, as you're going through and, and writing it, what was, the, uh, what was the behavior or the new thing that it enabled in a country somewhere around the world that you, th you uh, when you started the book, you didn't think, hey, uh, I'm going to run into this? What was the most kind of unique or, or interesting thing that you ran across in your travels through the Facebook ecosystem? Well, there's a lot of those, but one thing that I write a lot about in the book that I had really not digested how thoroughly it's changing the landscape, is Facebook as a platform for political action and protest. 
And the fact is that it is the easiest way that any ordinary citizen has to express their opinion about anything. And if they happen to express an opinion that has resonance with the community in which they interact, it can take off as a meme with unbelievable speed. And right now in Canada, there's a huge protest movement against the prime minister that started on Facebook. You know, we saw Colombia, 10 million people go into the streets, something that started in some guy's bedroom at 3 in the morning. You know, that, you know, in, in, in Egypt, it's, it's the Bangladesh. The, this is happening all over. Philippines, you can, if I, have, I have a Google uh, alert on the words Facebook protest. And every day, I swear to God, there's 20 stories. And, and uh, it's really an interesting landscape-altering thing for politicians, I think. It's not that Facebook groups actually change the situation in many cases, but what frequently happens, and this I didn't anticipate, is that Facebook gets publicity. For an, if, if you have 200,000 members criticizing the Prime Minister of Canada on Facebook, the offline press covers that. And it's as if 200,000 people were demonstrating in Ottawa, in a way, it's as a news peg. So then, then other things start to happen. That was something I hadn't anticipated, but that's one of many things. Yeah. Anyway, anybody else have closing thoughts? We, it does say zero on the on the. There's a oh, question. Oh, beautiful. Okay, one more. This will be the last one. One more question. As a heavy user of social networks myself. Identify yourself. Stephanie Peters, having an own consulting firm called Start Smart for Internets. Um, being a heavy user of social networks myself, I asked my, myself the question, it's all nice, I love my Xing profile and connect to other people and LinkedIn and so on, but the communication really gets awkward. On the other hand, I have Twitter, where it's so much easier to quickly communicate with others, and I ask myself, what is your strategy? Isn't there something like a merge of the very simple microblogging everybody likes and enjoys and goes so fast with the social networks everybody enjoys being part of? You mean like Zing, for example? Yeah. 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 Um, so, you are, you are, so the question is, do we see increased sort of integration between different networks, particularly around microblogging? I think the answer is yes. Um, I, you know, I think we're all probably thinking about you know, how to further open up our platforms uh, um, and, and integrating other services. And you can actually do this today already on, on Xing, this integration between Xing and Twitter. I'm happy to show you after, uh, after, this, uh, after the session. Uh, but there'll probably be more because you know there is there is people you know people want to communicate and and for them it's really an infrastructure so they they don't want to go to different places to communicate, so it'll be up to us to make sure we have you know an open system which enables communication across platforms and I th I'm sure you will see even more of that going forward. I just have one more question for you, Nizar. What's your growth strategy? Is it new countries or is it building out more in the countries you're already in or is it something else? Uh, it's both. Um, and so within our existing markets, you know, if, if you look at the number of people online with our, within our existing markets, I'm talking about Russia, CIS, Poland, the Baltics, et cetera, you're talking about maybe 75 million people. And if you look at the number of people living in those countries, uh, living in those markets, you're talking north of 300 million. So, you know, we see 100 million plus people coming online in the next few years, uh, addressable either via their PC or through what most people carry with them every day, which is their mobile. So within our existing markets, we see a tremendous amount of growth, and we're very, very focused on that. But as a you know federation, um, you know we selectively look at other markets and other strong local social networking teams to potentially add. Oh, so possibly acquisition too. Potentially, yeah. uh, you know, there's there's also the potential for organic rollouts in, in some cases. Cool. But uh, we're looking at both. Thank you. Well, three very smart CEOs. Thank you all. Thank you for Berta for everything. <laughs>